Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our nine o'clock service here at Cody Trinity Frogmore. My name is Nigel Ward. I'm the Associate Minister here, and I'll be leading this service. And later on in the service, our curate, Mark Smith, will be preaching. Before we begin, just a, a few notices. Um, if you're also people who attend the 10.30 service, you might like to know that uh, we're doing a Zoom copy session after each service, approximately 11.30 for about a, a fixed time of about a quarter of an hour. And anyone who joins in there on Zoom will be very welcome. And you'll find the, uh, uh, the Zoom link in our weekly newsletter. Can I also remind you that uh, our online prayer meeting will be on Wednesday, the 27th of January at eight o'clock. You'd be very welcome to that. And there's also a New Year's quiz on the 30th of January. Uh, an email has just gone out, which is an opportunity to sign up for it so that we know who's taking part. Now, let us turn to the order of service for morning prayer. If you haven't got it, it's just below uh, this screen and you can uh, bring up a, a copy of that service from there. Grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. We have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world and to seek the forgiveness of our sins, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may give ourselves to the service of God. So please now join in with our uh, first hymn, which is, My Heart is Filled with Thankfulness.
Thank you. We began the year uh, looking at the challenging and comforting passage in the letter to, uh, to Titus. And I'd last like to read again a couple of the verses from that, from that reading we had then on the first Sunday of our year. This is Titus chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse 13. We wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. And we know so often that we fall short of that uh, great aspiration, and yet God is a God who forgives and loves. So let us turn to him as we join together in the confession, which you'll find at the middle of column number one. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. Because of what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross, I can pray with confidence. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. Let us worship the Lord. All praise to his name. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Now, Andy Fraser is going to bring us our first reading from the prophet Ezekiel. The Bible reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 to 16. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As the shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on the day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries, and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines, and in all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in a good pasture, and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land, and there they will feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Andy. Now I invite you to join together and as, an, as we express our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. 
Now I invite you to join together in a time of prayer. And let us begin by sharing together in the prayer that Jesus himself taught us. As we pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord, and grant us your salvation. O Lord, save the Queen, and teach her counsellors wisdom. Let your ministers be clothed with righteousness, and let your servants shout for joy. O Lord, make your ways known upon earth. Let all nations acknowledge your saving power. Give your people the blessing of peace, and let your glory be over all the world. Make our hearts clean, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. The colic for today, the second Sunday of the Epiphany. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace, and in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. In our intercessions this morning, we are particularly going to focus on the work of STEP and then pray about the pandemic and vaccinations. Heavenly Father, we pray for the ongoing work of STEP, the St Albans and Harpenden Christian Education Project. With schools closed to most students, we thank you that STEP workers have been able to provide online resources. May they find many imaginative ways of keeping up safe contacts with the secondary school students in our area. And help them, we pray, to prepare well for the time when they again will be able to meet those students face to face. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh Lord, for your healing hand on those still being struck down by the COVID-19 virus. And we thank and we pray that you will bring comfort to the many who have been bereaved by this virus. We thank you for the vaccination program that is being rolled out in this country and for the many health workers who are giving so much of their time to make the rollout work, despite the many pressures on the health service. We pray too that there will be an effective worldwide provision of vaccines so that all may benefit from the insight you have made possible. And help us, we pray, to persist in acting responsibly while so many people are still in danger from the pandemic. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Within our parish this month, today, we pray especially for the people living in Pilgrim Close and Fairhaven. Lord God, as we continue to pray for the many residents in the parish, we lift before you the people in Pilgrim Close and Fairhaven. Make your children living in those places, may your children living in those places be able to find appropriate ways of supporting neighbours in need. And even with all the present restrictions, may the light of your good news be seen in their lives so that many will be drawn to you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Gracious Father, we pray for any known to us who are suffering the limitations of sickness or the sadness of loss. Grant them your peace, we pray, and enable them to trust in your loving power despite all they are going through. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now Andy is going to bring us our second reading from the Gospel of Luke. Hear the Gospel reading from Luke's Gospel. Glory to you, O Lord. The Gospel reading is from Luke, starting at chapter 18, verse 31, and ending at chapter 19, verse 10. 
Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be turned over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. On the third day he will rise again. The disciples did not understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them and they did not know what he was talking about. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man to be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, What do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus, praising God. When all the people saw it, they also praised God. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Thank you very much, Andy, and good morning, everybody. Nice to see you all. Uh, please do keep that passage open, Luke chapter 18 into 19, and let's pray as we look at it together. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we look at your word now. Would you help us to understand it? Would you help us to love it and to love you? And would you transform us by it, we pray. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have you ever had this experience, I wonder? You invite a friend along to church or perhaps to some event where you know they're going to hear something about the Lord Jesus. And to your amazement, they accept. They say they'll come. And even better, the talk, the sermon, which, frankly, you've been a little bit worried about. Well, it's brilliant. It's crystal clear, logical, passionate, engaging. And you are sat there thinking, this is so good. If I wasn't already a Christian, I would definitely become one after this. You're beginning to plan your friend's baptism, how they'll be useful at church. And yet all they say is you're walking home and you ask them how they found it is, oh, it was nice, or, um, yeah, the food was lovely. And when you ask how they found the talk, well, it, it turns out they didn't really get it. It left them completely unmoved. It's more or less what happened to William Wilberforce, the famous anti-slavery campaigner. He took a friend of his, William Pitt, the then prime minister, to hear a well-known British preacher. 
Wilberforce said he heard a most powerful sermon. Pitt, one of the finest minds of his generation, said, you know, I tried to understand what he was saying, but I had no idea what he was talking about. Maybe it's a conversation at work. You've been answering a colleague's question, their objection to the Christian faith. And for once, you've done a pretty good job. In in fact, you've amazed even yourself with how insightfully, logically, wisely, and yet humbly you've answered them. And so you're stunned when they still don't get it or say, I guess we just see things differently. Or maybe just maybe you are that person. Perhaps you've been tuning in for a few weeks now or coming along for a few years. And you like the songs, they're they're nice. You like the people, some of them. Uh, You like that there's stuff going on for the kids. But if you're honest, you're still no closer to getting the Jesus stuff. What all the fuss is about. You can see it has a real impact on some people. And maybe it's really important to your husband or your wife. But for some reason, it just leaves you cold, wondering what the attraction is. Well, why is that? Why can the same talk, the same message affect people so differently? How can it strike some people as the very best news in the world, something worth giving up everything for and giving everything to and leave others somewhere on a spectrum between confused and cold? Why does that happen? And what, if anything, can be done about it? Well, the passage that we're looking at together this morning is going to help us with some of those questions. It's answering the issue raised by Jesus in verse 27. Do you remember that from last week? The disciples totally stunned that this good man, the best humanity has to offer, isn't worthy of heaven. They asked Jesus, verse 26, who then can be saved? If not this man, this high achiever, then who? To which Jesus replies, verse 27, What is impossible with men is possible with God. The question is, how? How can God make what is humanly impossible possible? What does he have to do? And that's what our passage today is about. That is the question that it's answering. How can God make what is humanly impossible possible? And the first answer we see is that Jesus has to die. Do you see that here? Verse 31, we're going up to Jerusalem and everything that is written about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. It's no accident, Jesus' death. He's on his way to Jerusalem for that very purpose. It's what the Old Testament said had to happen. And what's more, the Old Testament explains why. Think of a passage like Isaiah 53. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Jesus had to die to take the punishment that even the very best of us, even the highest achievers, deserve for how we've treated God and lived in his world. And no doubt we'll be seeing more about why Jesus had to die as we get closer to Easter. But it means that if we want to get to the heart of the Christian faith, we will have to grapple with Jesus' death and what it means. That's the kind of talk we will ultimately want our friends to hear. That's the conversation we will ultimately want to have with them. That is the thing we're going to have to wrestle with ourselves. But there's another problem here. And this is where we're going to focus today. Verse 34. The disciples didn't understand any of this. And just to make sure we don't miss it, Luke says it three times. The disciples didn't understand any of this. Its meaning was hidden from them. And they didn't know what he was talking about. Isn't that amazing? Here are Jesus' top recruits, his best trained followers, people who have spent three years with Jesus, three years of intensive instruction. They are just a week and a half away from graduating and they don't get any of it. And yet, clearly, some people did and do. The little children we were reading about last week, for example, those who received the kingdom like little children, others we're going to meet in a few moments, some of us, I dare say. So what makes the difference? Well, earlier in Luke's gospel, Jesus says this. 
chapter 10 and verse 21, if you're taking notes. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. Do you recognize the language of hiding there? Things being hidden? It says, uh, Jesus says, God deliberately conceals things from people. People who are wise and learned, or at least who think that's what they are. Who are used to achieving intellectually, just as the rich young ruler was used to achieving morally. People who think that they're pretty smart, pretty savvy when it comes to spiritual things. God conceals stuff, hides stuff from them and reveals it to who? Little children. Does that ring any bells from last week? See, that's why the disciples don't get it. It's not because they're stupid. It is because they are blind, spiritually blind. So what needs to happen? What does God have to do to make the impossible possible? Well, the next bit of Luke chapter 18 gives us the first of two pictures. Two pictures which show what the disciples and we all need. The first is the blind beggar in verses 35 to 43. See, we see in this blind beggar something of a model approach to Jesus. Because here's the great irony. Do you spot it? This blind man sees more than Jesus' disciples. Indeed, he sees more than the others in the crowd. Because when he hears the commotion and asks what's going on, they tell him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by, which is true. But look what he sees. Look what he calls Jesus. Verse 38. Jesus son of David. How did he know? We're not told. But he's clearly heard enough about Jesus to conclude that he is the long-awaited descendant of David, the promised king, the Christ, the Messiah. Have you reached that conclusion yet? And look at what he asked for. Verse 38 again, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Does that sound familiar? It's what the tax collector says in Jesus' parable. Verse 13, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, I I know I don't deserve anything good from you, but I'm not here to wave my achievements in front of you. I'm here to receive from you. Have mercy on me. So he knows Jesus the king. He knows Jesus is the savior. And look what happens when people try to shut him up. A bit like the disciples with the children earlier in the chapter. Verse 15, he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. He kept going. He was persistent. Do you remember the widow at the start of chapter 18? The parable of the persistent widow? Luke is drawing all these different threads together. And so what does Jesus do? He stops, verse 40, and has the man brought to him. And look at the question that he asks. Remember the question the rich young ruler asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, here's a very different question. Here's the question Jesus asks someone who is ready to receive. What do you want me to do for you? And look at what the blind man says, verse 41. Lord, I want to see. Never let anyone tell you the Bible's been thrown together. Luke says he's written an orderly account. And so what happens straight after we're told about these spiritually blind disciples in verse 34, we meet a physically blind man who with great humility asks Jesus to open his eyes. Do you see the link? How can we understand enough to be saved? How can God make what is humanly impossible possible? Answer Jesus has to die for us, and Jesus has to open our eyes. Do you see that? Even if you find it hard to accept, can you see that that's what we're being told in this part of Luke? Jesus has to open our eyes. Well, we'll see more of what this means for us at the end, but first we're going to look at this next bit of our passage, the story of Zacchaeus. Because if the blind beggar shows us a model approach to Jesus... I think Zacchaeus gives us a model response to Jesus because he welcomes Jesus, verse 6. It's the same root word translated receive in chapter 18. What's more, he welcomes Jesus gladly. 
What a contrast to the rich young ruler who ends up what? Sad. And look at this for evidence of a changed heart. Verse 8, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, which no doubt he had, being a tax collector in those days, it was part of the job description, I'll pay back four times the amount. What a contrast again with the rich young ruler who just can't bring himself to, to give away, to part with his stuff. And so look at Jesus' conclusion, verse 9. Today, salvation has come to this house. In other words, this man has been saved because this man too is a son of Abraham. In other words, he's in the right family to inherit God's kingdom. Perhaps even he has learned to act, to receive like a child. Now look, I wish we had more time to go into each of those things because any of them could form the basis of a sermon. But the big thing I want us to see is how this rich man does the impossible. How he gets through the eye of the needle and enters God's kingdom. In other words, once again, how does God make possible what is humanly impossible? And the question we need to ask to see this is, who is seeking who? See, at first it seems obvious that Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus. At verse 3, he wanted to see who Jesus was. See, here is another man who wants to see. And actually, here is another man with a problem seeing, not because he's blind like the beggar, but because he's short. And being a short guy in a crowd is never easy. Trust me, I've been there. So what does he do? He climbs a sycamore tree. Well, so far, it looks very much like Zacchaeus is seeking Jesus, doesn't it? He's doing all the running, or, or more accurately, climbing. But look at verse 5. I think this changes everything. Verse 5, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So as Jesus walks along that road, he already knows where Zacchaeus is. What's more, he knows him. He calls him by name. And he doesn't wait to be invited in. He tells Zacchaeus to go and put the kettle on. I'm coming to your house for tea, as the song puts it. And so look at Jesus' summary of what's happened again. Verse 9, today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For this is the reason salvation has come. This is the reason this man has joined the family. For the son of man came to seek and to save what was lost. Who does the saving? Well, we know the answer to that if we've been knocking around Christian circles for a while. It is Jesus. Only Jesus can save. But who is it who's doing the seeking? Well, that's Jesus too, according to this verse. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So what has to happen? How does God make what is humanly impossible possible? Well, Jesus has to die. That's why he came. That's at the heart of the gospel. But that is not all. Jesus also has to open our eyes. He has to both seek us and save us because not only have we failed to make the grade but we are naturally blind to our problem and the solution and we're lost and either we don't realize it or we won't in our pride admit it so we need jesus to seek us and we need him to open our eyes well if that's the big point in these verses let me just apply it in a couple of different ways and for a few different people as we draw to a close the first is humility humility, recognizing our need for Jesus to open our eyes, humbles us. You see, there won't be a single person in heaven who is there because they were smart intellectually, because they investigated everything meticulously, or because they figured it out insightfully. There will no doubt be smart people in heaven. There will no doubt be people who investigated, who read books, who asked questions, who went on Christianity Explored courses. But the reason they will be there is because God opened their eyes to see who Jesus is and why he came. So look, you may never have thought about it this way before, but if you're tuning in today and you're a Christian, it is because Jesus sought you out and opened your eyes. And that, when we realize it, is profoundly humbling. 
means that your testimony is not just the first two lines of amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I think most of us are comfortable with that, even if wretch slightly sticks in our throats. But the next two lines are true of you as well. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now, by the grace of God, I see. If you're not yet a Christian, well, are you willing to admit that you are blind and lost? Or are you determined to figure things out for yourself, to find your own way? Yes, we, we may well want to put ourselves in Jesus' path. Both of these characters do that to some extent, don't they? And coming along to church, reading the Bible, asking our difficult questions is a great way to do that. We're not called to be passive, but we are called to be humble, perhaps in the way that we ask those questions. So that's the first application, humility. The second is praise. See, we may find it hard to get our heads around, and it, it may feel like our pride has been through 12 rounds with Anthony Joshua, but this is a profoundly good thing. That's why Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this was your good pleasure. This is a profoundly good thing. Thing. Because imagine if that verse said something different. Imagine if it was just the wise and learned who figured it out. We'd be unbearable, wouldn't we? And heaven would be full of people patting themselves on the back, telling everyone how clever they are, and, and God, how lucky he is to be spending eternity with someone so intelligent. Isn't God's plan better? Because not only are we humbled, but all the praise goes to him. So will you join with Jesus in praising God for this? And thirdly and finally, it means we need to pray. We need to pray for ourselves whenever we open the Bible. It's why we pray at the start of a sermon or a growth group. It's, it's not just the traditional way to begin, like the referee blowing their whistle at the beginning of a game. No, it's essential because by nature we are blind and we are lost means we need to pray for our friends and family. It doesn't mean we stop inviting them to things. It doesn't mean we stop trying to talk to them about things. It does explain why our experience is often like those scenarios I described at the beginning. Because our friends, however nice they are, however smart they are, are by nature blind and lost. So yes, they need to hear that Jesus has to die, but they also need Jesus to open their eyes. The fact that Jesus does that, that he does open eyes, is a great reason to keep sharing the good news about him. It means there's hope for that person who seems completely blind, totally lost. Don't give up. But it means we need to pray. Parents, do you pray for your children daily? Are you praying for your neighbours, for colleagues, for friends, for family? And last, and by no means least, if you're not yet a Christian, can I encourage you to keep investigating, to keep putting yourself in Jesus' path, tuning into church, reading the Bible, but can I also urge you to pray, to ask Jesus to open your eyes, maybe using the words of the blind beggar here, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, Lord, I want to see well, let's pray together now. Father God, thank you that the Lord Jesus is in the business of opening blind eyes. Thank you that he has done that for many of us. And we praise you for that. And we're humbled by that. And we pray that in your kindness, in the mercy of the Lord Jesus, he might do that for our friends and family. Those we long to come to see who he is and put their trust in him. We pray, Father, that we wouldn't just be morally like little children receiving, but that we would be intellectually like little children, recognizing we need your help to understand these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me hand back over to Nigel. Thank you, Mark. We have an opportunity now to respond to what we've heard uh, in our final hymn.
as we sing, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Thank you, our music group. And now, as we come to the end of the service, a closing prayer. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>